it's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoar frost appears on the ground, the grass, and the trees. And ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky and their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck and it won't be able to heat the earth any longer. But the worst thing is there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky and the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the Sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the Sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere, Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too, either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else, since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. 
If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall, though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they'd both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. Despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the Sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the Sun, and even the presence of the Moon in its skies, all of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the Sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay? Hop on! I've prepared a tour around Earth's fellow planets. Let's start with Mercury, the smallest planet in the solar system. During the day, the temperature on the surface of this planet can reach 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And during the night, it can drop to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures here are so extreme because the planet has no atmosphere. Instead of it, Mercury has a thin exosphere. That's one of the reasons why Mercury is not habitable. The temperatures and solar radiation are too extreme for any organism to survive there. Now let's imagine there's a way to live on Mercury. Then what would life there look like? Mercury's surface resembles that of the moon. Over time, meteorites left lots of marks on it. Unlike the moon's surface, Mercury is grayish brown. Now look up. The sun on Mercury would appear almost three times as large as it does on Earth. The sunlight would be almost seven times brighter. I wonder what type of sunglasses people would wear if we lived there. Can life appear on this planet in the future? Don't get your hopes up, it's very unlikely. Now, how about landing on Venus? You might think the hottest planet in our solar system is Mercury, since it's the closest to the Sun. 
But in reality, this title goes to Venus. What is it that makes Venus boil? The biggest reason is its atmosphere. It's made up almost entirely of carbon dioxide. The atmosphere is so thick that it leads to the planet warming up non-stop. Basically, the gases in the atmosphere prevent thermal radiation from leaving Venus. So, the planet simply can't cool down. The water on its surface constantly turns into vapor. If the surface of Venus was food, then its atmosphere would be the microwave. That's why the temperatures in this world can go up to 870 degrees Fahrenheit. What would it be like to live on Venus? On Earth, seasons change because of the planet's tilt. But Venus doesn't experience any significant changes throughout the year. Things are pretty constant at night and during the day too. And what about the view of the sky? The clouds on Venus appear yellow or bright white. They're mostly made of poisonous sulfuric acid. But then, why does Venus appear reddish-orange when you look at it from Earth? Talking about the true colors of planets can be a tricky business. The hue of a space body might be different when you look at it from another planet. If we traveled all the way to Venus, a reddish-brown surface would welcome us. The molecules of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid block sunlight coming into Venus's surface, hence the reddish-orange color of the planet. Oh, and did you know that Venus is often called Earth's twin? Both planets are nearly equal in size. Both have relatively young surfaces and thick atmospheres with clouds. Plus, the orbit of Venus is also the closest to Earth. That might raise a question about the possibility of life on Venus. I'm sorry to break the news, but no. Venus is not habitable. The next destination is Mars. Unlike Venus, Mars has seasons due to the planet's tilt on its axis. It also has a secondary seasonal effect caused by its highly elliptical orbit. The southern hemisphere has colder winters and hotter summers than those in the northern hemisphere. The average temperature on Mars is negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But temperatures can also range from the poles to the equator, and they can change very dramatically within a single week. Still. Not that bad compared to the previous two planets, huh? Is Mars habitable? The number one thing a living organism should worry about here is space radiation. Earth has a magnetic field and a thick atmosphere to protect its surface from radiation. Mars has neither. The planet's gravity is one-third of Earth's. So, weaker gravity and a thinner atmosphere make it harder for any living being to survive on the red planet. In 2013, NASA reported an ancient freshwater lake that could have been a hospitable environment for microbial life. This is evidence now that liquid water once flowed on Mars. This confirmation suggests that Mars could have had the necessary environment to support life. But what happened to the water on Mars? The most popular explanation is that the planet's atmosphere became too thin and cold to keep liquid water on Mars' surface. The disappearance of water might also be related to the loss of early magnetic fields. Or the reason might be the red planet's size. Mars is probably too small to keep water. So for now, Mars is not habitable. But you know scientists keep sending missions to Mars. Maybe they'll find some new information. Let's wait and see. Now Jupiter. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to live on the biggest planet in our solar system? Jupiter's environment is an unlikely place to support life. The temperatures on this planet and its composition are too extreme for any organisms to appear there. Jupiter has layers of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. These gases fill the entire planet. Quite literally, there is no solid surface on the planet. Gases go all the way to the core, below the surface. They become liquid and turn into plasma because the atmospheric pressure there is way more intense than any place on Earth. To put it into perspective, an organism on Jupiter has to resist 1,000 times more atmospheric pressure than it would on Earth. Can a living being survive in such conditions? Unlikely. Jupiter is completely uninhabitable. But hey, have you heard that its moon Europa might be a possible habitable zone? Change of scenery. Saturn. It's the second largest planet in our solar system. Like Jupiter, Saturn is a gas giant ball, mainly consisting of hydrogen and helium. What about temperatures on Saturn? It's freezing. Plus, there are extremely powerful winds there. 
The winds in Saturn's upper atmosphere reach the speed of 1,600 feet per second. Let's compare them to storms on Earth to have a better understanding. The strongest hurricane ever recorded on Earth was moving at 350 feet per second. So the answer to the question, is there life on Saturn? Seems pretty obvious. Life as we understand it doesn't exist there. The next stop is Uranus, one of the largest ice giants. Uranus's atmosphere is dominated by ice, but it's not the only reason that causes the planet's blue color. It's also the methane in the atmosphere. It absorbs red light and reflects blue. The same goes for Neptune. Uranus is the coldest planet in the solar system. The temperatures there can be as low as negative 371 degrees Fahrenheit. Life on Earth needs sunlight to get energy, but there's nothing on Uranus that can produce any energy for life forms to thrive. The bottom line is Uranus doesn't have the environment to sustain life. Heading for Neptune, the second ice giant. What is there on the planet furthest from the sun? Obviously, it's incredibly chilly. There's neither a source of energy that bacterial life can exploit, nor a source of liquid water. Currently, scientists believe it's unlikely to find life on Neptune because of such unfriendly conditions. So, what makes our planet so livable? And I'm not just talking about human life, I mean any living organisms, even microbes. Life requires very special conditions to exist. All living beings need some sort of food, water, and the right temperature to develop. The atmosphere is a vital element. Humans, for instance, need oxygen to breathe, and they can only survive in temperatures that aren't extremely hot or cold. Another thing is gravity. All the other planets I've mentioned don't have exactly the same conditions as Earth. Life there would probably be different than what we have here. All living beings on Earth have adapted to our atmosphere, and life forms elsewhere would need to be able to survive in that planet's conditions. You're going to Ilha de Quiamada Grande, one of the most dangerous islands in the world. There, you find yourself among rainforests, huge rocks, and grasslands. The place is home to birds, locusts, and giant cockroaches. But there's one more animal, and because of it, the island got its notorious reputation. Snakes live there, and a lot of them. So many that the place is also known as Snake Island. Will you survive there? Located just 20 miles away from the coast of Brazil, the island has an area of 43 hectares, or over 100 acres. It probably got cut off from the mainland after the last ice age. The snakes were also separated from most other animal species. They didn't have competitors and had an unlimited source of food. In such a small area, there are up to 4,000 snakes. That's one snake for every 10 square feet. It would be a difficult feat not to come across a snake on this island. Not only is this snake, the golden lancehead, one of the most numerous on the island, but it's also a highly venomous pit viper species. And it's also one of the most venomous in all of Latin America. Its venom is so potent due to the isolation of the species, with only birds sharing the land with them. To catch these birds, the snake's venom needed to become extra strong. And indeed, since they got separated from their distant relatives, their venom has become up to five times more powerful. Most of the time, these snakes hide in the trees or amongst leaves on the ground. If you find yourself stranded here, you'll want to keep yourself a safe distance away. Snakes mainly use their sense of smell and rely on vibrations. If you get too close to one, either stand still or slowly walk away. If you make too many vibrations, this will make them feel threatened, causing them to strike. If you spot them a safe distance away, or if you're walking toward tall grass, stamp your feet a couple of times. This will notify snakes of your presence. They won't risk taking down prey larger than they are and will likely slither away. Carrying a stick is always a good idea, just in case you happen to come across a snake accidentally. This way, you'll have an extension of your arm that cannot be bitten. This simple thing might save your life. A stick with a V-shape on the end will give you even more advantage. Even if a snake starts acting aggressively, holding it down will stop it in its tracks. But whatever happens, don't try to pick it up. Okay, but what if you get bitten? The chances are pretty high on this island, of course. First of all, don't try to get the venom out on your own. 
make sure you call emergency services immediately. And once help is on the way, apply a wide bandage. A piece of clothing will do if you don't have anything else. Don't try to chase the snake trying to identify the species. Emergency services know how to figure out what venom it is. Now, just keep calm and wait for help. You might be wondering who you can call on this abandoned island. Well, since it's strictly prohibited to visit this place, there are signs advising to stay away all over the island, along with a number you can call if you run into trouble. Let's say you've successfully avoided getting bitten. The next thing to consider is what you can eat there. Snake Island was previously known as Ilha de Quemada Grande, where Quemada is Portuguese for forest being lit up or forest fire. The reason for that was the fact that the entire island was deliberately set on fire to make room for a banana plantation. Unfortunately, the banana business didn't turn out to be a success, probably because farmers got sick and tired of snakes. But some banana trees still thrive today, and they can provide you with some much needed nutrients. You'll also want some protein in your diet throughout your stay. Luckily, along with the snakes trapped on the island, there are also cockroaches. These giant prehistoric looking roaches come out at night to feed on plants. Get that barbecue started and enjoy the rare delicacy this island provides. A great way to survive on the island is to avoid it altogether. If by chance you happen to be sailing past, keep in mind that this place was once connected to the mainland. Rocks beneath the waves are very likely to damage the bottom of your boat if you get too close. Make sure you keep an appropriate distance when traveling past. Sure, this island is intriguing, but please remember that no matter how close you get to it, you won't be able to see snakes from the boat. You can only see these creatures if you get close enough, which you really shouldn't do. And it's not only reptiles that make this location dangerous. Pirates visit the island quite often. Not the sea shanty singing peg-legged arr pirates, but bio-pirates who come there to capture the very thing that makes it so dangerous. They come there for snakes, to catch them and sell them illegally. Since the island got cut off around 11,000 years ago, the golden lancehead has evolved within its own unique habitat. So, although there are many reptiles on this island, they're still an endangered species. Due to their limited numbers, their value is very high, reaching up to $30,000 on illegal markets, which gives biopirates the motivation to catch them. I can think of better ways to make a living. Anyway, let's say you've got all the resources necessary to survive in one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Do you think you would manage this feat? Perhaps you think it's impossible. You'd be surprised at how possible it can be, if you know what you're doing. It turns out many have visited this scary place before. Research teams often come there. They study the golden lancehead snake, its environment, and its food sources for conservation purposes. But scientists always make sure there's a doctor on the team. There's also a lighthouse on Snake Island. It had been operated by people until the 1920s. Then it became automated. One guess why. Brazilian authorities visit the lighthouse once a year to make sure it's still functional. Locals on the mainland know the reputation of the island, so the stories of people going missing are minimal. But one group of fishers once got too close to the island. As they were sailing along their normal route, they accidentally neared the shore. Their boat hit a rock under the waves and began filling with water. As the boat was quickly sinking, the men had only two options to try to survive in the rough sea or swim to the shores of Snake Island. It was a hard choice to make. After all, they had heard the stories, and it wasn't just about snakes. Rumor had it that the island was cursed. Regardless of the stories, the fishers chose to take their chances with Snake Island. After making it to the shore, they tried to be careful. Their knowledge of the island could help them survive. Most importantly, they knew to avoid the rainforest at all costs. As the men got hungry, they carefully walked along the edge of the forest, warily collecting bananas. They were mostly sitting, waiting, and conserving their energy. They could only drink water when it rained. It was just enough to sustain them. They slept on the beach, unprotected from the elements and weather. And all the time, they were so close to the comfort of the lighthouse or caves. They were probably overly cautious, 
but it was either enduring some discomfort or risking their lives for a dry bed. They didn't yield to the temptation. They managed to survive for three days without being bitten by a snake. After that, a passing boat finally rescued them. So, now you know, anything is possible.